yeah, it feels like when you're going to a spot that you've been thinking about for a long time and you're like, fuck, what's going to happen, you know? I was just like, hey, if I survive, I'll be stoked. And I lost my points, I didn't get submitted, so that was kind of a, a little like little mini win, I guess. Yeah, it was just that first one, you get all the nerves dumped out like in the first two minutes and you're just kind of gassed out. But kind of, he had this weird kind of like shoulder crunch thing going on and I was just thinking, I was like, fuck, I wanna go surf tomorrow. I don't want my shoulder to get all fucked up. So I was kind of just like holding my elbow in, hoping that my shoulder didn't get too jacked, but I feel good, honestly. Walking out not hurt is like a win, I guess. I didn't really know much about it, but I just figured you had to be kind of tough and like, I don't know, a certain type of person to do it or maybe get good at it. And he just always said it was just fun. And that was like a concept I never really thought about. I just figured it was just intense and which it is, but at the same time, it is kind of what you make it and it can be fun too. And, and I was kind of trying to stop drinking as much and kind of kick that stuff out of my life. Skating is like a very athletic thing, but a lot of skaters don't really, uh, treat it that way in regards to like the life they live outside of skating, you know? It's a lot of just boozing and eating whatever and which is kind of what makes it fun in a way, but at a certain point like my body was just shutting down my elbows and my wrists and everything was just so beat up and I just was not having a good time. So I think that reality check made me realize that I can still skate the way I want to. I just need to take it more seriously in the sense of treating my body the way it needs to be treated. I can't imagine some of the falls that they take compared to like what we're doing. You know, like we have nice soft padded mats. So it's pretty cool. You know, these guys are, you know, it's gnarly. Starting jujitsu kind of made skating fun again in a weird way. It just made it feel like I didn't need to put so much pressure on myself with the way I handled skating and kind of went about it. You need an outlet that is uh, gonna get you in shape. You're learning a skill, but it's also like giving you that therapeutic, you know, like cleanse that we all kind of need after working in, you know, kind of today's society. I think with skating, you just, I don't know, yeah, you get stuck kind of in like a fake reality a little bit of like what life is. And at least for me, I was kind of stuck there, I guess, and struggling to, get past that and then once I realized that I can just kind of, you know, do normal things like exercise properly, eat right, it, it helped a lot. Get to decompress after one of those. This is uh, Valley Middle School where I went to middle school. Definitely attended many more classes here than Carlsbad High. Yeah, I tried to curtain this thing and just Dude, I thought you seriously just Close. fucking died. This place has a number on my nuts. I've definitely hit a couple sacks in this school. We would come here like Monday to Friday, go to school, and then get dropped off here on Saturday and just skate around all day like these schools. But in Saturday hindsight, week, it's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, we just can't leave this vicinity right here. We get kicked out by like the teachers that knew us. So they'd be like, you guys, come on. You can't be skating in here. Then it's just like an awkward next week of school. It's kind of funny. Yeah, we're at uh, Carlsbad High School where I went to school for a couple of years and super famous skate spot. And I had a class that was right at the top of the uh, at the gap, so I would look at it like every day, but I didn't even realize, but this is where the landing was and like, this is where Ellington does the big spin, rolls away, all that stuff. Kids knew about it. A lot of kids skated that went here, but uh, yeah, I don't think anyone really thought much of it. 14 right here, great white buffalo, only got away. When I first met Riley, I think we were such little kids. It didn't take long to, you know, just gravitate towards one another. You know, there's only like three kids who brought skateboards to the whole school, so. Random. It's actually not as chunky as I remember it being. It's just weird that they would remodel and spend so much money on the school and then just leave this fucking, <laughs> leave this chunky ledge over here. Should we look at the up rail real quick? Pretty good. T-Spliff just like floated through every obstacle here and just fucked it up. He would come from here and then front feeble up and then he did front feeble back when AD landed, but he would land on that side every time. Yeah, if you go to like any spot around here, you'll hear 
T-Spliff's name a lot because <laughs> he just annihilated everything around here. I tried to be here as like minimal as possible when I went to school here. <laughs> Cause they would let us leave for lunch and then we had the skate PE class. So we would just be like, we weren't even at school pretty much. What was the skate PE class? We would uh, drive to this old skate park that we'll go check out. Yeah, they would send a teacher over there and he would just watch to make sure you're skating. And it was like an alternative for PE. You could just go skate, pretty crazy. Oh my God, Carlsbad Park. <laughs> I did not think it was a good park. I didn't enjoy skating it, but they all figured it out and I think they were better for it. At my high school, my friend Ted and my friend Corey and I, we created a skate PE class for Torrey Pines High. And so when I heard that Riley got to do a Carlsbad High, I was like, yes. Kids would leave school like looking normal and you had 30 minutes to get here and they'd show up here just looking like fucking Cheech and Chong, just like the highest you've ever seen. Cause he gave you 30 minutes to get here. It was like a 10 minute drive. That Carlsbad skate park is where like the bonds truly were all formed like and solidified, you know? That's where we met like a lot of dudes like Rowan and Nick Pope and all these kids that were from uh, like Vista and that area because it's kind of right in the middle and we would just all meet up there and just skate from 9 a.m. till 9 p.m. pretty much. All we needed was a bowl that we could do tricks from the top of the deck to the bottom like it was a stair set. We would just skate that for hours. <laughs> Wow! Still, to this day, tray flip. Yes! Feels way bigger than I remember. The obstacles just weren't quite right, but, but they made it work for themselves, and then when they would go out into the streets, it's get anything. I mean, yeah, like me, Jacob, Buddy Tanner Cribs, T-Spliff, kind of just North County San Diego homies, and Kirby would come down from San Clemente and just crash with us down there and we we're just like just full just kids like probably Rowan is like the most well-known guy that I remember meeting there as a kid his parents would drop him off there and we would just skate all day and then eventually pick him up because we had cars by then and take him street skating but his parents thought he was at the skate park the whole time because he was still so young his parents were kind of tripped out about him going out and being in the world skating but yeah it's kind of funny to look back that that was like how the program we were running back then <laughs> he was always the kid that we all knew like yeah rowan is like the best he's gonna be the best and he definitely was because he was so young and he was already doing just cool like kind of creative style skating that maybe we weren't even doing at the time we were like older than him you know but yeah it worked out for him good it was cool around here back then to have like homie videos. Like it was way more of a thing to have just like your crew and you film videos like you're filming for a company kind of, you know? Before we knew it, people were kind of doing tricks on spots that was like, oh shit, this spot's in a magazine and you just did a trick on it. You know what I mean? That type of stuff. And so it kind of just happened out of nowhere, I feel like. And by that time we were already making the videos, so we just, we just kept making them. It's a pretty good lens on there too. Who's smoking here? Oh, nice. Yeah, no one was really working on like full length for companies at that time. We we're all just like such little kids that we just took it into our own hands to like just get our piece of making a full length video, you know? So throughout those years, whoever was in town and would uh, want to come skate with us or would be crashing on the couch, they would kind of be deemed a Shep dog. And it was awesome to watch as an outsider. All of them blossom into these incredible skaters and artists and musicians and, and filmers. And it was just like, it was just a ball of lightning. All the friendships were so like organic that we didn't realize that what we were doing was a like outlet or a way to get our names out there. You know, like it was a really special time looking back in hindsight because it was just all happening so naturally and we didn't even like realize what we had. <laughs> At the time, it was very progressive. I thought it was fascinating watching the rise of the dogs. It was cool. I didn't even get on Baker and stuff till I was like 18 maybe. Yeah, so like the third video by then. That's what it took. He got turned by one of the most prestigious skate companies, Baker. It's not like there wasn't some nepotism. It was like, here he is. Andrew Reynolds says you're pro, you're pro. We had a lot of time to just like film as homies and just make our own videos with no obligations to uh, give footage to anyone. And then that is ultimately kind of when the video stopped, when it was 
people were actually on companies and getting right. taken on trips and like had obligations to use the footage for like Vans or Baker or Death Wish or whatever it was. So. At the end of my 20s, I was kind of just having a rough time like mentally and physically and just skating it just, I felt like kind of run its course in my life. What's required to be a pro is much more taxing now if you're trying to make it as a street skater. He's only 30, but he's had a pretty storied career already because he doesn't rest on his accolades. He, he wants to keep doing better and better and he can skate anything. I enjoy it when our paths finally do cross or if we find some common ground on a mini ramp or something, but um, it's pretty rare. For him, I just wanted him to enjoy it. Like I, I just didn't want him to skate because he felt pressure to or because he thought that he had to because he's my son. So, I, you know, I just wanted him to really find his own way. And he did in a big way. I'm hugely proud of, of the man he's become and, and that he's still motivated to better himself. And I'm so thankful that he and Francis found each other. So I feel like he's got a bright future and he worked hard to get there. Like, I don't see myself as like a relevant pro skater and I'm definitely aware of that, but it's cool that my sponsors still want to support me and yeah. let me like be a pro skater. I'm super grateful that, you know, Lakai puts my name on a shoe and Baker puts my name on a board and Brixton is super awesome about making sure that I'm taken care of and skating and I'm just grateful that I still get to do it pretty much. Imagine in 17 years still being in a van with dudes like skating across America or wherever it is, is kind of an awesome and frightening thought all at the same time. But I'd like to do it as long as my body lets me, like I said, until it's just, you know, not fun or not making sense. That's just what I'm gonna keep doing. Ah! <laughs>